Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth episode of Front Row and Center, a virtual series presented by Colorado Music Hall of Fame in celebration of our 10th anniversary. Thank you all for joining. My name is Karen Radman, and I am the executive director of the hall. And I'm so honored to have as our guest tonight, the founder of Colorado Music Hall of Fame, Chuck Morris. And our host tonight is the legendary and founder and uh, editor of Westward and a Hall of Fame board member, Patty Calhoun. So during tonight's interview, if you have questions that you'd like to ask to Chuck, please type them into the chat box and we will pull them out during the um, interview as well as uh, hold some time at the end for participant questions. In the meantime, pour yourself a libation and uh, please welcome Patty Calhoun. Thanks so much, Karen. This is gonna be a blast tonight because as those of you who know him realize, Chuck is very, very shy. So it's a great honor to get him to answer a few of our questions. I encourage you, if you are responding to something he's talking about, want a question, type it into the chat room. I'll see if I can get into it. But this is gonna be a wild and very fun ride. I don't think there's a name that's appeared more in Westward over the years than Chuck Morris. He is legendary. He is so intrinsic to the music scene that we all love in Colorado. Oh. And he has stories. So we're gonna let Chuck just start in the beginning, which is how did such a mild mannered fellow who came to Colorado when he was 20 years old for graduate school in public, uh, public science, po political science, how did you become a concert promoter? Go, Chuck. By the way, I lost everybody's picture. I don't know what I did here, but- You only have, do you have me? I don't see anybody. It says Zoom, open Zoom meeting. I don't know what happened. We have you, so just go ahead. Okay, I'll just go ahead. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, um, the son of a school teacher um, in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, not the most expensive neighborhood in the world. Um, grew up, uh, I was a very, believe it or not, a very good student. I graduated, uh, I was in my, I started kindergarten at four years old. If you took some type of test, you could start early. And then I skipped the eighth grade. So I graduated from, actually we moved to Forest Hills from Brooklyn when my father became an assistant principal and made a few extra bucks. So we moved to a, a apartment house in the poorer section of Forest Hills, a nice section though. And uh, went to Forest Hills High School, same high school, by the way, as Paul Simon and Artie Garfunkel were probably the only two people I knew in the music business. Although they were four years ahead of me, but I was best friends with Paul's little brother, Eddie. So I'd, stay, I'd hang around the Simon house a lot. They were in Key Garden Hills. Um, loved music to death, it all, um, but never thought I could make a living out of it. I, um, my parents, my father was up uh, during the summer, he was off being a school teacher and then a principal. So he was a camp counselor at Lake Chautauqua, New York. Anybody knows about Lake Chautauqua? It is the most wonderful summer resort where they have concerts and symphonies and opera. It's been around for about 150 years and we'd go up there and he'd work there. And I started going to concerts um, and, and the Chautauqua Symphony, one of the best summer symphonies in America. And uh, when I was 11, I saw a band, most of you, if you're too, maybe too young for this, but uh, maybe the best folk band ever called the Kingston Trio when I was 11 years old. And something lit in my brain that I loved them and I loved folk music. And I started buying every album of theirs. I started getting into all of their contemporaries from the Limelighters to Bob Dylan a little bit later to all that kind of stuff. Judy Collins, by the way, from Denver and um, collected albums, started playing guitar, not particularly well bought a Martin four string tenor guitar, which uh, Nick Reynolds from the Kingston Trio played because he was my idol and played around. I wasn't very good, um, but I loved music. And I, and I used to babysit at 12, 13, 14, 15 so I could make money to buy albums and go to some concerts. And um, at um, went to Queens College, it was a free university, um, did pretty well and got a, a partial scholarship to come out to Boulder, Colorado to go for a PhD in political science. Always loved politics. People know I've done a million benefits, political benefits, because that's my second love. Um, I actually thought it was my first love. I thought I was going to do something in it when I got my doctorate. Um, but after two years of graduate school, 
and I was a TA at 21, and I did well. Um, fell in love with Colorado. I mean, I'm going from Boulder or going from Brooklyn to Boulder. It's not much of a toss up there. And fell in love with Colorado. Wanted to stay, and but I decided I I would I just didn't want to go three more years to get a doctorate. So I dropped out. I wanted to have something to do with music, something to do with people. Didn't know what I was going to do. And I got friendly with a wonderful gentleman who passed away a couple of years ago named Herbie Kabar, who owned and operated the sink on the hill in Boulder. Anybody knows Boulder and CU knows about the sink, one of the legendary college hangouts. And I used to have a beer with him. It was 3-2 beer then. The, the hill didn't have hard liquor. Uh, after I'd leave New Orleans Library studying and preparing for my classes, I might have a beer with Herbie. And I really liked him and he really liked me. And one day I told him I had dropped out. And I almost fell over the chair in the front bar when he said, by the way, my manager, the sink just quit yesterday. Why don't you manage the sink? People love you around here. You're really smart. And I think you'd make a great manager. And I actually tried to convince him that I wouldn't. I never had any experience running a business uh, or a bar. Um, and I said, you know, I, he said, you'll do really well. So I started managing the sink. And the sink in those days, that was the heyday of the sink. Um, remember, there was no cover charge at the sink. And on a Friday afternoon, what they called FAC, I think they still call it that Friday afternoon club, it was literally a half hour at four o'clock to get in just from people showing their IDs. And I managed it in its heyday and I started doing some promoting things and I realized I had a, you know, a pretty keen eye on music and things like that. Um, in the back room, I had heard about this band that was just starting and they had done one date and they were rehearsing. And I had a great bartender named Kevin Fitzgerald. People might know, became one of a world famous veterinarian, went to CSU veterinary school. And one of the funniest guys is also a stand-up comic. And his first day being a bartender from, from me, I knew Kevin Fitzgerald was gonna make a great veterinarian. He said, why don't you come over to my house? I wanna show you something. And I went to his house and he went into his closet and took out a box and grabbed it. And it was a live python, which I almost died of a heart attack. And he treated it like it was a puppy. So I knew Kevin was gonna be a very successful veterinarian. He's become a world-class veterinarian, but anyway, Getting to the point, uh, Kevin told me about this band that was rehearsing and just getting started called, Fle called Flash Cadillac and the Continental Kids. And uh, he took me over to see their rehearsal and they were amazing. For those of you who don't know, they had a long career, they're still touring. They were, in, they were a regular on Happy Days. They played in the movie American Graffiti. They were an oldies act. They were sort of a, a secondhand version or a, a, another version of Sha Na Na. They played old 60s. They were very funny, a little bit gross. And um, they were just rehearsing to get started. And I said, why don't you play the back room of the sink? We had never had music there on a Friday afternoon. And they did, I gave them all the beer they could drink. And we set every record in the history of the sink because you couldn't get in the place. And it was amazing. And then I discovered another kid who had moved to, to Boulder from Sioux City, Iowa, that I became really close with named Tommy Bolin. For, you, for those of you who may not know, Tommy Bolin was one of the greatest guitarists in the world, died tragically at 26 from an overdose, like a part of our business used to have that kind of abuse. It was so sad, but in a short career, he got a chance to join the James Gang. Um, actually, funny story, Joe Walsh was the leader of the James Gang from Cleveland. Joe had left Cleveland, moved to Boulder to start Barnstorm. And um, the other guy, two guys broke up and Joe saw, saw Tommy play actually at my club, my second club, Tulagi's, and called the other two guys and said, you guys shouldn't quit. There's a kid guitar player that's better than me. And they auditioned Tom and he, and he joined the James Gang and they made two albums. They made a big comeback. And then he left to try his solo career. And then he got a break to, to, uh, to join another band and my mind escapes me, a very big band, um, Deep Purple. They were looking for a lead guitar player. They were huge in those days. They were arena act around the world. And he joined Deep Purple at 23, played for two years, a year and a half, and then started his solo career, which was ready to explode and die tragically on the first night of, he was special guest to Jeff Beck on the Jeff Beck tour in Miami. It was tragic. In fact, I went to his funeral in Sioux City. But if he was alive today, he'd be as big, if not bigger, than Eric Clapton. He was that good. And it's uh, amazing. I, I, I'm going to interrupt quickly 
So Chuck, when did you realize you were never going back to finish that political science PhD? When did you realize music was your future? When I had so much fun booking some local bands in the sink and in the upstairs room. And then um, I did some really things that I really got off on. You know, the sink made money from a jukebox. One of the most successful, that's all the music they had. And I came up with this crazy idea. The jukebox people that owned, it was a monopoly. They just followed the top 40 hits and that's what they put into jukeboxes. Well, I had this crazy idea that I wanted to get album cuts and stuff that weren't hit singles and put it, and I got permission from the uh, jukebox companies. And I, I, I like uh, went to a 45 store and, and made like, like the Lone Ranger theme, which everybody knew, but it wasn't a hit single or some of the album cuts from the Rolling Stones, which kids wanted to hear, but they never could hear it at a normal jukebox. And that jukebox became the number one jukebox in the state. And I knew I had a really sharp eye on promoting music. And about two years after managing, in, in the process of managing the sink and breaking records there, I convinced Herbie Kavar, who was a wonderful guy, um, that we ought to buy a bankrupt Tulagi's nightclub on the hill and reopen it as a national club because uh, Boulder and Denver was exploding then. People like the Dirt Band were moving there and Dan Fogelberg moved there and Joe Walsh moved there and Stephen Stills moved there. We had a great radio station called KRNW, which became KBCO. And they, in those days, they had what we call freeform radio. They played everything. They didn't have a playlist. So they played jazz and folk and country and bluegrass and of course rock. And the kids were into every kind of music. And um, so I said, to Herbie, we, at Tulagi's, which was really a dance hall at the time for many years, uh, was bankrupt, that we ought to take it over and start booking, I, I would book national bands, and I did, and it exploded. You know, we had the first tour of Bonnie Raitt, we had the first tour of, uh, um, oh God, there are so many acts to play there, Dan Fogelberg, Bonnie Raitt, uh, I wish I had the list in front of me, and we had, and, and we did jazz acts that sold out for college, because I had Cannibal Adderley and, and Mose Allison and uh, Les McCann and Eddie Harris had folk acts like the Dirt Band and Leo Kotke and John Fahey and every kind of music and college kids were into it because the college radio stations and the, and, and the, and the rock station KRNW was playing it all. And it was a wonderful time for music. And we did tremendous for three years. But um, my only thing about that was when the bands got big, I would be, I was the first guy to bring in a guy named Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks, which did tremendous. But when they got bigger, or Linda Ronstadt's first tour, um, they would play for this guy in Denver, this big promoter named Barry Fay. And I wanted to get bigger. And he would always, he was the big Yiddish, Jewish expression. He was the big macha, you know? And when bands that I broke for the first time in Colorado in, in Boulder, and they got bigger, they usually played for Barry. That's just the way the game was. And I decided if I wanted to get bigger, I better call him. Now we fought over the phone and he usually won over Axe. And in fact, I opened to Loggies with a band he managed, Tommy Bowen's band Zephyr. And we fought then over that night because uh, Candy Givens was an hour and a half late. The leads got another one who died tragically. She was great, she died, but um, she came in an hour late and at the end of the night, I was such a rookie. It was my first major show. It was the opening of my first club. I, I said I had to give 75 refunds. So I, I took 75 tickets off, the, off what I paid him. And Faye, of course, they, they called Barry. He called me screaming. He said, what'd you do with the 75 tickets? I said, I sold them. There was still a line around the block. He said, then we get the money, you idiot. But I, I, I knew if I wanted to get bigger, I might have to go into business with him. I had never met him. But one day I had the nerve to call him and I, and I didn't think that he would take my call, but he did. And I can't say the word, but he's, Barry's way of saying hello is what the do you want? I said, hey, Barry, I've done, I'm a young kid and I've done really well with this club and I put, you know, book names you didn't even know about. And I'd like to go into business with you, maybe open a club in Denver and then do bigger shows. And to my astonishment, he said, I'll come up tomorrow night and talk to you, which I hung up and said, I hope I'm making the right decision. I had never met him in person. I didn't realize he was 300 pounds at the time, which is no big deal. Barry's weight used to go up from like 180 to 300. And uh, the next night he came walking in, sat in my office and said, you know, you're the best young club kid I've ever seen. You, you've, got, you've picked bands before I know about them. Uh, what do you want to do? I said, I'd like to open a club with you and be partners. 
And he said, okay, you find a room, we'll be 50-50 partners and I'll put up all the money. I, I still had spent, I had I'd done fairly well, but I, I, in those days I was young, I spent a lot of money on bad things and cars and stupid things. So I didn't have much money, but uh, we found a club called Marvelous Marvs and we changed it. And I named it Ebbets Field because I grew up in Brooklyn, 10 blocks from the baseball park of the Brooklyn Dodgers. I was an avid Dodger fan at eight years old and went to, to Ebbets Field. And um, we named the club Ebbets Field because of that. And it's funny, we use the original um, artwork from Ebbets Field. And it, in today's world, I would have been enjoined by the Los Angeles Dodgers from even opening it using their name and their likeness and their, you know, even their, their whole insignia, but nobody cared in those days. And we opened up and it became Billboard Club of the Year a couple of years, it became huge. And we had a lot of great acts there that came in for the first time. That's where I saw Fogelberg, that was his first date and Maria Muldor and we had every kind of music. And then after four years of running Ebbets Field, Barry, Barry and Cindy Faye being the silent partners, Barry came to me and said, why don't you sell the club? Um, you know, he's, he was starting to do the Stones in a lot of markets and the Who, and he said, why don't you join the main company, the parent company, Faye Line, and sell the club, and which is really what I wanted to do anyway. And I became his right-hand guy for 10 years. And we did, you know, we did Willie and Whalen tour. We did the Stones and the Who, every act, every major act. Faye Line really had no competition. And I learned a lot from Faye. Um, tough guy to work with, but I loved him. Um, uh, and did that for 10 years. And then when Barry was having financial problems, which he from time to time had, um, I decided it was time for me to leave after, God, 12 years with Faye. And I was man I started managing bands while I was the number two guy at Faye Line. And I picked up a band called the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. It was the third act to play for me at Tulagi's and all moved to Colorado and they became great friends. And their career was sort of in the toilet. And their first manager, a guy named Bill McEwen, who is John McEwen's brother, John McEwen from the Dirt Band, he called me from Aspen and said, why don't you come up? I want to talk to you. And, and he managed another act that played for me at Tulagi's and headlined for me at Ebbets Field, a comedian named Steve Martin, who was exploding, as everyone knows. And he said, I want you to come up and have a, have a dinner with me and John, my brother. And Bill said, you know, I'm just getting ready to, to do this movie called The Jerk. And I'm so busy with Steve, I'm not paying good enough attention to my brother's band. Why don't you take over? And I, again, I tried to convince him. I said, I've never managed anybody. I'm a promoter and a club owner. He said, Chuck, I'll never forget this. And he was right. It's just the other side of the coin. You'll be fine as a manager. You love the guys. You know the music better than I do. And I took over, I remarketed them in the country world, got them a country deal because rock radio wasn't playing bands with banjos and violins. Uh, it was down at summertime and, uh, and got them a country deal. And we had a string of 15 country hits. And I did the, I produced the Circle Beyond Broken volume two, which was album of the year and had a wonderful, wonderful comeback with them. And then I picked up another old friend who played for me at my clubs, Leo Kaki, renowned guitarist and managed him up till last year for about almost 35 years. And I love Leo and um, that was fun. And then I picked up a little bit later, a young band um, that got started at Columbine High School uh, called Big Head Todd and the Monsters, who I saw at Herman's Hideaway and I was blown away by the guys and chased them for a year because they were managing themselves and doing a pretty good job, I might add. And, you know, we took them and got them a big record deal and they did an album called Sister Sleetly that sold a million and a half records. and. Uh, had something to do with their success. I still promote them, but I don't manage them anymore. And um, that's where it was. And, and finally, when Barry decided to retire, I always said I was the number two promoter in Denver and Boulder, all over the state. I decided to come back and maybe go back to promoting. And I called my old friends at the Bill Graham company that um, Bill had died, but his the, the, the other guys had taken over, a guy named Greg Perloff mainly and Sherry Wasserman. And we had co-promoted Feline, we had co-promoted with them some dates like the Stones in Hawaii and some other places. And I called Greg and I said, Greg, you know, Faye's retiring. Um, you know, I really feel like I want to start up a promoting company and you'd be a great partner. And I'll never forget what Perloff said. He said, um, 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 you, uh, hang on, I can't hear. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, he said, um, you know, Bill always told him 
never to come to Denver because they, did, they didn't want to screw around with me and Faye because we sort of own the market. But now that Faye was retiring and I called, I'll come on a plane tomorrow. And the two main guys from Bill Graham Presents, uh, Greg Perloff and Nick Klainis, who is Bill's uh, lawyer and became partners at BGP, uh, flew in and said, you know, we'll do a partnership. And I started Chuck Morris, Bill Graham Presents. And the first thing I wanted to do, um, I always intrigued by um, Mammoth Gardens, which is a beat up old place, but it was built in 1909. And I always thought if you fixed it up, it could be a great hall. And Bill Graham, of course, started the Fillmore East and the Fillmore West. He owned the brand name. I thought it'd be great to call it the Fillmore. And the first major thing we did was to buy it and remodel it and open a Fillmore, which was a smash. And um, when I made the deal with BGP, with Bill Graham, they said, Greg, I'll never forget, he said, you know, there's this guy named Bob Silliman, who is maybe buying our company and buying a whole bunch of promoting companies and forming a company called SFX. I said, well, what does that mean for me? You know, we were brand new, the Chuck Morris, Bill Graham part of Bill Graham. He said, well, they'll give you a nice check. You'll, you'll, you'll continue. We're all staying on. We'll have more money to invest and um, it'll be a bigger company. And I said, well, that's a no brainer, I'm in. So we became SFX. Uh, SFX, then Bob Silliman bought like the 14 biggest promoting companies in America, combined them all to SFX. And then two years later, sold them to Clear Channel. So we became part of Clear Channel for a couple of years. And then Clear Channel spun it off in, uh, into Live Nation, which I continued with the same staff and ran that for this part of the US and, and did that. And then uh, 14 years ago, an old friend of mine who I adore named Phil Anschutz um, came to me eight, and he had started a company called AEG, which is Anschutz Entertainment Group, and um, called me and said, why don't you come by the office? I had gotten friendly with Phil, funny story. Phil never goes to concerts, rarely, um, but loved the Dirt Band and used to go to Dirt Band shows. In fact, in 1960, 1986, I was doing the dirt band in Winter Park and I wanted to use, Phil owned the ski train and I wanted to use the ski train to sell tickets and have people uh, train up there and train back. And then they can drink and not worry about driving. And I called Phil and Phil said, you know, in those days he didn't use the ski train like the Cheyenne. It was only for to skiing to Winter Park. He said, well, I don't like to use it in the summer. I said, Phil, it's the dirt band. And I'll never forget, Phil said, okay, I'll let you rent it. We'll split the money on the ticket sales but the only way I'll do it is if the dirt band come on the train with me. And he literally, the dirt band went on the train with Phil and Phil stayed for the whole show and had a blast. Two years later, he uh, called me uh, in 1988 and said, what's the dirt band doing July 17th? This is of 89. And I said, they're off for two weeks, which is unusual for the dirt band being off in the summer. He said, well, do you know about my Anschutz art collection? I said, yeah, Phil, don't you remember you gave me a tour? And Phil has, Phil um, is very successful. He has the largest Western art collection in the world. Once he started making money, and he first started making money drilling oil wells with his dad and still owns a bunch of oil companies and owns train companies and blah, blah, blah. But he said, uh, my Western art collection, the Anschutz collection is opening up at the Trekia Museum in Moscow. And I want to do something different. I want to fly you and the band and your girlfriends and wives to Moscow to do 30 minutes acoustic to open up the opening night of the Anschutz collection, which will be there for six months. And he even gave us a fee. And I said, really, you want to fly us there to do 30? He said, yeah, I think it'd be really cool. And great part of the story is I called Phil the next day and said, the guy's excited. And by the way, he said, I'm going to do other business in Moscow for nine nights. I'll pay every expense. We'll go out for dinner the other eight nights and then we'll go home. And um, I told Phil, I said, we're doing it, don't worry, but the guys would love to play in front of like younger people because this was the art community, press, TV, the whole, you know, uh, the political people in, in Moscow. It was still the Soviet Union. In fact, the, the government fell about a year and a half later. So you can imagine how terrible it was as far as falling apart. I said, the guys, could you get us a couple of free dates on the other two nights? They'd love to play in front of younger people. And if I ever thought Phil was such a deal maker and such an amazing guy, he said, Chuck, the whole country's falling apart. Sometimes it takes me a day to get a phone line into Moscow. I deal with Soviet Union officials and they disappear on me because the Russian mafia was taken over then, right before the revolution. 
He said, but I'll try to get him a couple of free dates. And he called me back in three days. And I could never believe this. Only, only Phil. He said, okay, the first night you're going to do 30 minutes at the Trekkia Museum. The second night I arranged a private concert at this beautiful 5,000 seat theater. And we're inviting Soviet Union officials and their families, the US embassy and all their families. And we're going to give away half the tickets to Russian students. And the third night I arranged, and I can't believe he did this in three days, right before the Russian Revolution. He said, and I hope you don't mind, I said yes without asking you. I, I wasn't really sure if you and the band would want to do it. I said, Phil, we'll do anything you want. This is going to be the funnest trip we've ever had. He said, okay, you're going to do a free concert in Gorky Park. For people that don't know, that's the Central Park of Moscow. And we played in front of about 15,000 people. And how Phil to this day did that, I have no idea. But I became best friends with Phil. And then when he started AEG and started getting building buildings around the country and doing tours and clubs, um, he came to me and I went down to his office. He said, you know, have you noticed that we have an office now in London? We built the O2 and in Berlin and LA and New York and China, but we don't have one in my hometown and I won't do it without me. And uh, so I left uh, Live Nation to start AEG 14 years ago and it's been the best 14 years of my career. We've had a blast. And, you know, we took over the Ogden and the Bluebird and the Gothic and we built uh, the first bank center we took over and then we, we built the Mission Ballroom. And we do about 125 shows a year at Red Rocks and we took over Fiddlers and remodeled it because I always thought that would do better if they fixed it up. And uh, we've had a great run. And the last part of my story, am I talking too long? No, I was gonna interrupt you, but we'll come back. Keep going. Uh, the last part of my story is I never had any plans in my music career. I just followed my gut and I was very blessed and very lucky and I made some good decisions, but I always wanted to teach music business in college. I spoke on one-offs to a bunch of schools and I had the time in my life. My dad was a school teacher. I grew up with teachers and principals and really wanted to teach. And I was a TA at 21 years old at CU teaching Poli Sci 100 and I love that. So. Um, my one dream was to start a music business department at a Colorado school, and I got several offers, and I started this last year at Colorado State University. I'm chairman of the, of the, of the music business school at um, CSU. We started off with one class. We, had, we went to three classes. We're adding a fourth class the, second, the spring of next year, and it, now you can get a certificate. And in two years, you can get it. It, can be, it will become a minor and then a major. And I'm having the time of my life running this department and bringing in a whole bunch of my friends as guests. I brought in so many great people that have spoke. Everybody from Big Head Todd to Mike Gordon from Fish to Ben from Mumford and Sons uh, to you, na you name it. All my friends and they've all been great about it. I've had executives like Jay Marciano who runs the AG worldwide. I've had the number two guy at Live Nation. Uh, Bob Rue, I've had Paul Tillette, my great friend who owns Coachella, the biggest rock festival, come in and talk. I've had a time in my life and I, I you know, it, it's been, it's just been wonderful. I'm still a consultant for, for AEG and um, working on a young Latino girl who just turned 15. And uh, there's something with, her name is Raquel Garcia and uh, working on her career. So I guess I, I wanted to slow down, but I don't think it's in my genes to slow down because I haven't. I'm pretty sure it is not in your genes to slow down. But just to be sure we don't miss it, you, you also had another dream, the Colorado Music Hall of Fame. So why don't you talk about the origins of that? I mean, so many of the names you've mentioned, like Tommy Bowen, like Zephyr, they have become inductees in the Colorado Music Hall right. of Fame, Joe Walsh, as you have. So talk about how this came about. Well, Leo Kaki's brother, my oldest friend, he's the third actor played for me. We're still best friends although I retired from management. So I gave him to my nephew, Kevin Morris, who's a great manager who works at the Dave Matthews company and manages Alabama Shakes and Amos Lee and a bunch of acts. And he's known Leo since he was 12 years old. And he, I gave him, uh, he's taken over and done a great job. But I went to um, the Minnesota Hall of Fame event about 25 years ago. Leo's lived most of his life in Minneapolis and he's been inducted into the Minnesota Hall of Fame. And so is Prince and all the acts that have come out of there. And I went to an induction and I was blown away by it. And I said, why doesn't Colorado have one of these? We've had a great tradition. So I slept on it for about 10 years because I didn't know where I'd put it. And then when we took over the first bank center and remodeled it, 
we had room there. So I finally had a place and that's when we got a great board together and started the Colorado Music Hall of Fame. And it's been, it's been great. We've inducted some great, great people from, uh, oh God, Judy Collins who grew up here to John Denver, Firefall, Chris Daniels, Caribou Ranch, the astronauts, three of the guys from Earth, Wind and Fire who grew up in Denver, especially Philip Bailey, the lead singer who went out to LA and joined the band on their third album. And they got real big from that. And it's been a blast and I'm loving it. I'm on the board and I was very honored to be inducted last, was it last year, two years ago. And this is the 10th anniversary year of the Colorado yeah. Music Hall of Fame. And they're doing, there's an auction going on right now with great experiences, two of which you're leading, I believe, a backstage yes. tour of Red Rocks and a concert with uh, Nathaniel Rateliff. Give us a preview, what amazing things about Red Rocks would people find out? Well, if any, well, I would assume most people listening to this have been there, but if you haven't, it's probably the finest, most beautiful amphitheater in maybe in the world. It is a stunning place. I've done, I added it up with the different companies that I've either ran, I've been the number two guy. I've done like 1400 shows there. So I've spent half my life there. Um, it is just stunning. It's the middle of a mountain and it's gorgeous. And every act I've ever known, almost every act, uh, loves it. Baby acts and big acts. It's usually their best day of the, of the summer to play Red Rocks. It's a stunning place and a beautiful place. And it's, it's, you know, Steve Martin, who I booked for years, who became a very big comic. And then the jerk, the movie, he became a superstar. He, I'll never forget, funniest line about Red Rocks. I was doing Steve Martin for two sold out shows at Red Rocks. I think it was 78. And it was the most beautiful night. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. You can see all the, you know, it was just gorgeous. And he was such a funny guy. He walks out on stage, gets a huge, you know, all everybody in those days were wearing his glasses and his phony nose and screaming for him. And he looked around and looked around at the rocks, this beautiful sight and people screaming. And he, and he was such a creative, funny guy. And I'm not sure if he had lived this or he planned it. And he turned around to the audience and said, I can't believe my manager put me in this dump. Can you excuse me for a minute? I want to, I want to go call him. And he walks off stage like he's going to call to complain to his manager, which is one of the funniest lines about Red Rocks because it was so untrue. But only Steve Martin can do that. What about the backstage tunnels? Well, that's a famous place. The tunnel that goes from backstage to the sound booth under the rocks, under the, under the seats. Um, and it's been autographed by many it's it's full it's a long tunnel it goes from the from the stage area all the way to the sound booth which is halfway up the, up the amphitheater and it's signed by so many artists every artist usually signs their signatures and um some of them uh, rain has has gotten rid of you know smushed them up but there's so many famous acts because everybody's played red rocks actually I have a funny story my daughter Brittany, who obviously grew up backstage um her husband, Tim, a wonderful guy, proposed to her at a Big Head Todd show. And I knew this was happening. I, I said, let's go to the tunnel. We'll watch Todd uh, in the sound booth. And we were walking up. And I said, what is that? And he, he had planned the whole thing and it said, Brittany, will you marry me in the tunnel on the cement? That's how he proposed to my daughter. Oh, that is great. So again, if you want to bid, you will be able to tour with Chuck Morris who has many more stories. I have to give you a shout out. Your cousin Amy is on. Oh, Jesus. Amy Dorfman Schechter. Hi, Amy. All right, so we've got some more questions. You managed the Divinals? Yes, I did. Great Australian band that never quite could happen in America. I saw them in a festival in Australia and I thought, Chrissy, that band was amazing. Um, and I, I was their American manager, actually me and Faye together. Um, they were one of those brilliant groups that may have been five or 10 years ahead of their times. And she was so talented, died young, um, uh, just never quite happened in America. In Australia, when I saw them, they were selling out arenas and were huge. So I convinced them they ought to have an American. They were actually the head of their label. Jack Crago was a friend of mine, said, why don't you let Chuck and Barry manage you in America with their Australian manager who was really good. But we just couldn't crack that band here. And that sometimes happens. It's really amazing, but, and Chrissy, if anybody knows their records, uh, they had one hit called uh, I Touch Myself. They had a great song when we were managing them on their first album in America. 
uh, it was called uh, Pleasure and Pain, which I thought would be such a big hit, but it just didn't hit. It's just one of those things that just doesn't happen in America, where sometimes bands are huge in other countries and can't break in America. So a couple more questions. One, are you thinking of ever doing a book and specifically a book on Ebbets Field? No, I'm thinking, of, I'm actually getting ready to start a book on what I've done in my career. And I'm, I'm best friends with a great writer who's gonna write with me named Holly Gleason, who's a great publicist and she's written some great books. I've known her since she was, her first interview, she was 16 in high school and interviewed my dirt band years oh, ago. Wow. And she became a big, uh, she's written several successful rock and roll books. And she's uh, was a publicist. She's still the publicist for Kenny Chesney, one of the biggest country acts and a great friend. And we're gonna write it together in the next year, I hope. If I well, find good, because people on this Zoom want to know about that. Also, another question is, do you see a big festival coming back to Denver? You know, people might disagree with me. You know, we, 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 we did the, uh, a festival near Dick's, um, and it, we had some great acts there. Widespread Panic, Dave Matthews, uh, a whole bunch of acts. And we did it for three years. We didn't do terribly, but we didn't do very well. And some of those acts did more people on their own playing three days at Red Rocks or playing whatever, playing Coors Field. And my theory was that unlike Austin, like Austin City Limits and Lollapalooza in Chicago and some of the other great festivals, I'm not sure people are, and I'm not, I'm not saying this in a bad way, they're spoiled. They have such beautiful places here. I'm not sure people inside Denver want to sit in a field in a park somewhere and see 20 acts when they can see those acts on their own um, at places like Red Rocks or a beautiful baseball park or Fiddler's Green that we remodeled. And I'm not sure, and I could be wrong because um, uh, the, the, I'm not sure if Denver is the right place for a major festival inside the city. Now in the mountains, it's another story, but inside the city, I'm just not sure because we had such a great lineup. The ambiance outside Dix was not the greatest. Um, and I have to admit that that might have hurt us. But I, I really came to the idea that maybe it's not the right town for an inner city festival. But I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Speaking of being wrong before, one, uh, one Zoomer wants to know, what is the biggest regret of your career? Oh, Jesus. I don't have any regrets. I really don't. I don't look backwards. I mean, I really don't. Um, I mean, I've made mistakes and I've had my bumps in the road. Um, I guess um, I, don't talk very, I don't talk about it very often, maybe straightening my personal life, drugs and alcohol a little bit earlier than I did, which was 32 years ago. That might've made a difference, maybe. But in the old days, the business was a, a party. Not anymore, you know, it's owned by billionaires and publicly traded companies and you gotta have your shit together. And um, the people that still party are, uh, are either, my old friends are either dead or out of the business. It's become too big a business. And maybe if I would have gotten uh, sober earlier, but I don't, I don't know if that would have made a difference because in those days, everybody was partying in the music business, but not anymore. I mean, I always kid around, but it's, I think it's true. I know people that are stockbrokers that party more than people I know in the music business. Well, that is a sad commentary. Uh, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk. Before you went to academia, back, which should should have done your parents proud. After fifty years after you were getting your PhD, let's talk about the mission a little bit and why you thought why the mission came to be. Well, we always thought that we could build a better mousetrap than we built when we built the Fillmore. It was twenty years later or whatever it was, eighteen years later, and Don and Brent, my great partners. Um, we looked all over town. Don even took a helicopter to look for sites. And, um, and then we got, um, we bumped into these guys called Westfield who were developing um, Rhino and had a great site to build a club. And uh, I think uh, I'm real proud, but I'll tell you, Don and Brent had as much to do if not more than I did. Um, you know, Don got started running the Fox, still owns the Fox. I got started running clubs. You know, we had a lot of experience together. We had a great team. I'm now just a consultant and they're, they've taken over as co-presidents and they're, they're tremendous. Very proud. It was 27 years working with those guys. 
Aside from Red Rocks, what's your favorite venue in Metro Denver? Good question. Oh, wow. Um, well, I have to tell you, the Mission Ballroom. And followed, followed, I hate to say it, it's my competition now, but followed by the Fillmore. But I was proud that I helped build it. And, I, and people, some people thought I was crazy. In fact, my old um, partner, um, I won't mention his name, he's been deceased, but he said something in the paper about Chuck is real smart, but I don't, you can't turn gold from a turd talking about Mammoth Garden was such a dump. And we proved him wrong. And um, so I'm real proud of that, even though that's our competition. You know, I've got, in my old age, I'm not as, you know, uh, maybe I mellowed out a little, um, but, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for our competition, for other people in the business, and a lot of respect for people in the business who've made it different ways than I did. I sort of always like to have really great partners that could help fund me. Uh, I don't mean fund, I mean fund with a D. Um, but, you know, the people, uh, you know, other people that have done it on their own um, and, and um, you know, and have done it their way and, and um, you know, people do it different ways in our crazy business. Is there an act that got away that you would have loved to have booked or produced or managed? Got away or died or what? What do you mean? Uh, escaped, escaped your um, ability to book them or manage them. Oh, good question. Somebody you really coveted handling. And yeah, there are some that we didn't get that, that our competition has gotten through the years. Oh, we've been blessed to get a whole bunch of them. Um, God, let me think about that. Uh, okay, you can think about that. Well, I'll tell you, I did the first date with you too at the Rainbow Music Hall, which is the Feline wow. building, and got real friendly with the band. I love those guys, and I still do. And actually, on a vacation a year later, you know, when they played the Rainbow, people forget it took three albums before they came real big. And actually, they got they got real big with the show we did at Red Rocks, you know, under the Blood Red Sky. And um, I love those guys, and I still do. But they signed with my old company for like a 15 year deal. So they're, they're playing with them. Actually, they were nice enough. I was a little embarrassed, but uh, the last time they played Mile High, you know, I'm sitting in the sound booth with their manager, their old manager, he's since retired, a guy named Paul McGinnis. And I was sitting next to the president of Live Nation. And Bono said something like, hey, I really want to hats off to Chuck Morris who gave us our first break. And I'm still friendly with those guys. I love them, but um, you know they signed a long-term contract with my old company, so I don't promote them. I still go to their shows and hang out with them. They're wonderful, wonderful guys. They haven't changed one bit. When I, a quick story, when I went to Dublin after they played for us, and people forget the first two records were critically acclaimed, but didn't sell very well. I think it was Boy and Soldier, I think was the first two records. I was on vacation in London, and I called Paul McGinnis and said, I want to fly into Dublin and take the guys out for dinner. And he said, oh, Chuck, you're going to do that? I said, yeah. And they were still struggling. I mean, they were, they were poor kids from Dublin, and they were starting to happen, but they weren't rich at all. And I, and I said, when I got to Dublin, I checked into a hotel, and Paul said, call, call the Edge, the lead guitar player. He wants to pick you up. He just got his first car that day. And I, and I called David's his real name, and I called the Edge, and his mother answered. He was still living at home. And she said with this big Irish brawl, David, there's an American on the phone. And David got on and said, Chuck, I can't believe you came all the way here to take us for dinner. That's so cool. I just got my first car. I'm going to go pick you up at the hotel. And he came in this beat up old TR3 with a broken top. And that was his first car. And uh, that wasn't that long ago. What was it, 84? I can't even remember what year. And last time when they played, I went on a, I didn't go on a plane leaving Denver, but I went with them to their plane because they were sitting on the runway for a while before I left. And I reminded the edge of that, of that day. And he said, oh my God, Chuck. Yeah, that was my first car. They're, but they're just as sweet as they were at the beginning. They're wonderful people. That's the only loss, but hey, you can't have it all. Well, and speaking of all, you had some great wins. So talk about when you co-produced Dan Fogelberg's tribute album. Well, Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I love Dan Fogelberg. We're friends. People might not know, but he lived for about eight years in Boulder. Um, grew up with his manager, Irving Azoff, in Illinois, um, and moved to LA with Irving, who's been the biggest manager ever. 
as his first client and best friend. And then he moved to Boulder for eight years and then he moved to Pagosa Springs where he lived uh, basically till he died. He died tragically of prostate cancer, way too young and the nicest guy and was so big. For those of you who are young, you might not realize he had to sell out three Red Rocks. And sometimes he'd play and sell just as many tickets. He'd do acoustic shows without his band, just solo and would sell out a couple of Red Rocks. He was an amazing talent, amazing songwriter and singer. And Irving came to me about six years ago and said, why don't you help, you love Dan and he loved you. Um, this was after his death. Why don't you put together, we want to put together a tribute album. All the money's going to go to prostate cancer research. So I helped with, with his wife, uh, Jean, Jean Fogelberg, who I got real friendly with. And we started making calls and we put out an album that was a tribute. It was 13 Dan Fogelberg songs. And um, people on the album included Jimmy Buffett and Zach Brown and of course the Eagles. Michael McDonald, Donna Summer, her last recording, by the way, before she died. Vince Gill and Amy Grant, who were married and did a great duet. Um, my Dirt Band did uh, Run for the Roses. Randy Owens of Alabama, uh, Dobie Gray, Train, et cetera. And it was, uh, I was very proud of doing that. And all the money, every penny went to prostate cancer research, which is what killed Dan way too young. Yeah, that is, that is great that you did that. Here's a question that yes. kind of bridges both the music promoting business and your current education career. What kind of effects has the internet had on the music industry? That's a good question. You know, I don't, I think the least effect it's had is on live music. Everything else you can get different ways. You know, you can get free music, you don't have to buy an album. You can, you can, um, you know, but you can never replace the live experience. So I think live, the live promoting, the live concert business is as strong as ever. And, you know, all the companies here, AEG and Live Nation are all doing pretty damn well, except with COVID happened. Everyone was closed for 14 months and you're just reopening now. But I, I think you can replace everything except the live business. Um, and certainly there's so much eagerness now as, as uh, concerts are being rebooked. Here's another question, which is of sure. all the, the venues that no longer exist, which ones do you miss the most? Oh, wow. Talking about live. Well, I love Tulagi, the place that I opened and we had some of the greatest shows there on the hill and um, some great experiences. It really got my career humming. And uh, we had some legendary shows there. And um, I love that place. Uh, people are that old, like me, you know, used to sit on pillows on the floor. It was like a big ballroom. And then there were seats around the sides, uh, booths. It's, it seated about 500 people. And we had everybody in the world playing there for the, for the what, three, four, three and a half years. I, I, I owned part of it and ran the whole thing. But that really became the first, you know, major rock and roll hall in this area. Now the family dog was real big, but people forget the family dog was only open for less than a year. Um, and that started Faye's career and had some great acts there, believe me. But um, we have one of the producers of the family dog movie on this Zoom right now, and they're part of the Hall of Fame uh, 10th anniversary packages. But yeah, the, fall of, the family dog has an outsized influence given how short I, how short you know, I was managing the sink then and I was too busy running a very you know big bar and uh, never went down to the family dog so I really? never saw it. nope and um but it was they had some big people play there I mean Barry in his heyday was brilliant booking great acts and getting to be friends with great acts I learned a lot from Barry I also learned other things like how not to run a business. I'm not saying that in a bad way. Barry was not the greatest businessman in the world. How to yell at reporters. Barry yeah. was good at that. Yeah. And editors. I about Barry, and don't get me wrong, he's the best man at my wedding. I love the guy. But my joke about him was that he was personally responsible for the development of HR in America. I'm totally convinced of that, by the way. And the continued employment of HR people. So is there an act you've never seen live that you would like to? Yes, Jimi Hendrix. Died before I really got in the business. Would have loved to see him. Play Anyone guitar. else? Oh, God. Um, oh, now I'm really going to show my age. 
Yeah, I would have liked to see Al Jolson, believe it or not. <laughs> That's really old. That's okay. We have some members of the Carver Music Hall of Fame who are that old. Well, he was dead, I think, even before I was born or close, but I saw some of his movies and some of the stuff he did. I was fascinated by him. Absolutely fascinated by him. And, and here's I, the one as a kid, I used to go, I knew there was something about music. Um, I would save all my money and babysit when I was 12 and 13 and 14, and I would buy. I would go standing room only because we didn't have a lot of money to see Broadway musicals. And I actually wanted to be an actor at that point. And my mother was totally against it because some of her friends' sons were actors and they were all struggling. But I, 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 was act, I acted a little bit in school. I actually wanted to go to the, to the um, uh, School of Music and Art, but never ended up there. But... Um, that was, uh, I used to go to see, I saw the original like Oklahoma and South Pacific and you know, in the, in the mid fifties and used to get for, I think it was 25 cents. They would sell standing room only the afternoon in the matinees and, and they'd only sell at that matinee. And you would stand behind the last seat in the downstairs. And I watched the shows I go on, uh, on the subway and uh, go see Broadway shows. And I loved that. So I guess I had an entertainment bug my whole life. And you had to be the coolest babysitter ever. So we just have one more question that came in. What's the most surprising thing you've discovered as you've been at CSU with that program? What's the most surprising thing that came from a student? Well, I'm having the time in my life and what surprised, it really wasn't a surprise, but what they know about music and what they love about music, it's just beautiful. And I've had a million guests that they've been blown away by and building this program is maybe, could end up being my biggest, my and personally my my favorite accomplishment, to be able to teach kids about the music business because I never there were never music business schools or classes when I grew up. I wish I could have had some, and there are some now. But I want to build the best program before I finally call it a day totally. But um, I've had the time of my life, and I'm I actually Nathaniel just told me he's gonna he's gonna speak next semester. Nathaniel Raitliff and his manager Chris Tetzelli. I'm gonna have a, I'm already lining up a bunch of great guests. And I love it. I love, I love Fort Collins. I love the school. They've been really supportive of this new department. And um, I'm having a blast. And maybe being the son of a school teacher who became a principal and then on the Board of Education in New York, I always had great respect for teachers. Well, that is great. I am about to throw it over to Karen so she can talk a little bit about the Colorado Music Hall of Fame 10th anniversary celebration. But congratulations again, Chuck, that you oh, came up with this concept and it made it. And so Karen, if you're ready, we'll throw it to you. But Chuck, do you have any last words right now before we go to Karen? Um, God, not really. Just if you love music and you want, let, let's put it this way. I always speak in my first classes to tell people they shouldn't go in the music business because it's so difficult and so underpaid at the beginning and so hard to get a break. But if it's in your blood and you can't get rid of it like I did, then go for it. And don't take no for an answer and don't give up. That's been my first speech in all my first classes. And it's a very wise one. So Karen, are you listening? Are you ready to come on? I am. Hi there. Thank you guys so much. Chuck and Patty, that was, that was an awesome interview. Chuck, I've heard so many of your stories over the years, but there were a number tonight that I did not, I've not heard before. So um, like the U2 uh, dinner in Dublin, that was, that was awesome. That was my first introduction to Red Rocks growing up in Connecticut was that U2 video. Um, so as Chuck and Patty both mentioned in celebration of the hall's 10th anniversary, we are currently conducting this very cool online auction. Um, you can see on the screen now that there's these 10 experiences that we've put together, including the two involving Chuck that he talked about. Um, bidding ends this Sunday at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And all of these experiences, they each one has a, a different number of folks that, that's to be involved in it, but it's anywhere from four to 10. So the, the kind of the concept is that you grab your friends or family and you know, bid on these together. Um, so please register to bid, go to cmhof.org um, to our website where you'll find more information and the link to register to, uh, to bid on these awesome experiences over the next few days. 
So thank you all for joining us for Front Row and Center featuring Chuck Morris. Uh, we'll be resuming these virtual episodes in September. We're gonna take July and August off so that you all can go to live concerts, um, hopefully instead. Uh, so be sure to join our newsletter list if you aren't already on that so that you can be aware of who our guests will be in the fall. Um, and you can also register uh, on our website for, for our newsletter. So thank you all and um, have a good night. Chuck and Patty, if you want to say good night really quickly, that would be awesome. Good night, everybody. It's been my pleasure to, to talk tonight. It's my honor, actually. Thank you and all. I have, to, I have to say what a pleasure it's been, even when he's mad at us, to report on Chuck and what he has done for the Colorado music scene, the Colorado cultural scene, to help put this state on the map in a place where it will always stay. You know what we didn't talk about was Hickenlooper. You've got one minute. Talk about one of your biggest music fans. I love John Hickenlooper. For those that don't know, he's maybe one of the greatest musicologists in the world. My joke to John, we've been friends for years and I've done a lot of benefits for all his campaigns, mayor, governor, and senator. Um, he'll, go to, he'll go meet a band that I'll introduce him to and he'll talk about an album, the third cut from 15 years ago, and the band won't even remember, but John can tell you, tell the band about it. He is a brilliant, he just loves music and is just such a brilliant musicologist. And my joke around is that he goes to more concerts than half of our staff. And uh, he's a wonderful guy and brilliant. And I'm a, I adore the guy. Don't know how many gets to, he gets to go to in DC, but it's great to have a Colorado politician who likes to push Colorado culture, which we all should be doing every day because it's a fabulous state to live in, to listen in. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you.